Okay, welcome to the first talk of this session. Uh, we will have Andreja Novakovic from uh, Geometry and he's going to talk to us about building functional commitments and as I understand also some possible applications. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Hello everyone. I'm Andrea, uh, cryptography research at Geometry and I'll be speaking about this uh, quite recent primitive uh, functional commitments. Uh, it's the paper from Dan Wilson and Alex Ozdemir and I'm going to speak about how we implemented it, uh, which tooling we built around it, and some uh, joint op optimizations that we, that we got together with them around this. So before we start looking at the scheme and what you can do with this, uh, I want to state that it's uh, very different from uh, what we have in like common ZK SNARK setups where we mostly argue about the existence of some witness that satisfies some relation. And circuits are in general like uh, explaining or like uh, describing some relations. And we have here something called functional commitment. So it's important to note that not every circuit is a function and every function is relation. So like functions are the subset of all relations. And you can easily see that you can, for example, for same public input, find two different witness assignments which will satisfy the relation. And in order that something is function, you must have that for same input, you always have same output. So we need to introduce some restriction on the circuits to make them uh, functions. And uh, if you see in this setup, there is no witness, so we just have public input and uh, public output, and the circuit itself will be a witness. So what we want to have here is like proof uh, of execution of some function, which is totally private. So uh, we want to prove that f of x is epsilon, where the verifier will not learn anything about f itself. So the mental model will uh, look something like uh, prover will commit to some oracles. Uh, we verifier will check that it's function, and then they can engage in pretty much classic IOP for proof of execution of that uh, committed function. So uh, first, we are going to talk about what does it mean for a circuit to be a function, like how to introduce this restriction I mentioned. Um, we are going to speak about some uh, a little bit different polynomial identity checks uh, than what we are used to in the, in the current setups. Uh, we are going to show how can you instantiate this scheme from Marlin, um, how you can instantiate it from Planck, and a few applications that we had in mind around it. So without further ado, uh, we have two different arithmetizations, so Erwin CS and uh, Planckish. And in order to make something function, uh, you can think of that it's enough to show that every witness that exists in a trace uh, is uniquely determined by all the public inputs and we don't have private inputs, okay? So if every witness in the trace is uniquely determined from the public inputs, uh, you have function because for same inputs, you will always have same output. Uh, and it's quite technical proofs. Uh, I'll just try to give an intuition. So for example, for R1CS, if you like write down the A, B, and C matrices, and then if you look uh, uh, a bit closer, you'll see that if A and B are like strictly lower triangular matrices, and C is diagonal matrix, you will have this feature that every uh, assignment, every new row of assignment is uniquely determined uh, from previous rows. And you can like just check uh, by like multiplying row by row and see that since everything else is a zero, uh, you will get that feature. And for Planck, it's much harder to show. So you need to do some intuitive things to show that uh, your uh, sigma, like your wirings are actual permutations. Uh, you need to prove that selectors are either turned off or turned on. And you have to do uh, some very tricky stuff with uh, topological sort of the gates input and outputs and show that like your circuit and wiring is uh, like well formed and that they describe uh, the, the legit circuit. But it's quite technical and uh, we can talk about it later. So 
uh, once we have that, uh, we need to create a proof of functional relation for our circuit from this scheme. Uh, we commit to that, verifier can check that it's a function, and then, as I mentioned, we can have like classic uh, Plonk or like Marlin IOP for proving the execution of that function. Uh, there just is no like witness. Um, so it has its own tricks, and if we look, for example, at how you create proof from Plonk, you have some witness oracles, and you just compute the number of like unique queries to it, and you sample some masking, you mask it, and with every single new proof, you sample new masking, you, ma you send it as an oracle, and you have the zero knowledge. The problem here is that once you have the indexer, which will index the circuit, which will like create the description of the circuit, um, you must send those oracles to the verifier, and once the verifier checks that it's the function, you cannot change it. So there are problems, like if you allow changing it, prover can always uh, like sample different function or like the protocol is very infeasible because with every proof of execution, you need to have a proof of functional relation, which is very expensive. And you want to make sure that prover is always running the same function. So if the prover has a chance to re-randomize the function and like, because the polynomials commitments are, look very random after masked, uh, he can just simply commit to different function. So we should distinguish like two types of witness oracles that can exist in the protocol. So we have these witness oracles which can be remasked with every new proof execution. And we have to distinguish this like indexer witness oracles, since the circuit now is private. Uh, the verifier has no idea anything about them. It, it can just query them, and those commitments should not be changed. So uh, it's quite complicated to like batch all these proofs and merge them. And uh, we built one really nice framework we call zero over k, which allows you to play with these polynomial identities of different types over different domains. And uh, we used it mainly to make uh, this proof of functional relations that I mentioned. And then it was very like modular, so we extended it a bit. And now, since you can look at, for example, Planck or like Turbo Planck, Ultra Planck, whatever, as just one huge polynomial identity check, um, you can, for example, take the assignment from Halo 2 or CK Garage or any other like front end. Uh, framework, you can implement a few traits for your gates, and you can use our zero over k as like a general turbo ultra plunk prover with all custom expressions and everything. And we have some uh, nice ideas how to create some like custom hash provers with that and to combine it with Colk to get very fast membership proofs. And it's uh, it's very general tool that can be used for uh, for a lot of stuff. Um, so. This slide will be a bit technical and uh, mostly interesting for people who are very deep into Marlin. So I'm not gonna spend too much time. Uh, I just wanna say that in order to make the Marlin index private, you have to introduce some changes and uh, it can be quite tricky if you uh, start like from some existing uh, implementation. So one obvious change that you have to make is that this inner sum check that happens in Marlin is like working with uh, A and B polynomials who, as I hope you know, are describing like row, column, and value polynomials of your uh, matrices, which are describing circuit. So you must make that inner sum check zero knowledge sum check. And also you have a little bit different setup. Uh, it's still R1CS, but now the assignment formation is a little bit different. So it goes like public inputs, then witness, and then public outputs. So you also have to check that uh, this like assignment is well formed. And there is uh, some like uh, very technical stuff about witness shifting in Marlin. And uh, if you get to concrete implementations, you have uh, uh, some domain reindexing in order to, to use FFTs and stuff like that. And it is very tricky for us to do that 
because if you re-index anything, you lose the properties of the matrices. Like you lose strictly lower triangularity and uh, diagonality. So we had to like remove that and add some more uh, well formation checks to make sure that it's all zero knowledge and working. Uh, and we have this implemented. We also have a really nice small library where you can like express constraints for R1CS and it will be compiled to this specific matrices and specific assignment so that you can use it uh, to prove execution of a function. And for Planck, on paper, it's much easier to discuss what should be done in order to make the Planck like index private. So your private and uh, selector polynomials are now private, like uh, your permutation and selector polynomials are now private, so uh, that's okay, but you need a different way of handling them. If you remember that I mentioned that these are the polynomials which are produced from the indexer, so you cannot that easily work with them. And also, even by knowing something of the relation of the public inputs, you lose the zero knowledge on your function. So you need to add kind of a layer of dummy gates to mask the relation of the public inputs. Um, it's quite tricky to implement since the frameworks are not very suitable for diving into the, mar uh, into the, the prover and changing how you like. But uh, we are very optimistic that this already mentioned zero or K framework will actually help us a lot and that it will be very easy to modify a few, a few parts of the Planck so that we have like index private Planck. And uh, wanna speak a little bit about applications. So um, I guess you heard Jason's talk yesterday. He was speaking about uh, ZKML and uh, uh, like privacy in machine learning. So what we think we can achieve with this and is like very interesting application is that instead of hiding just w uh, like weights of your neural network, once you train the network, you can like extract computational graph. And you can commit to that uh, computational graph that you will be using for inference so that you can have private weights and private neural network. Like, all the stuff, which is like architecture, number of layers, everything will become private for that neural network. And you can still prove the execution with the functional commitment of that neural network. You will like engage once in the, in the protocol to uh, make sure that the, whatever the prover computed is a function, and he will always be able to prove you uh, the, ex the, the inference in a private way. Uh, where all the stuff about network are like just uh, hidden from, from the verifier. And there are like applications that, for example, if you have some search engine or something like that, you can prove that you did same search algorithm for all parties, like that you're not modifying it based on region, gender, or whatever. And in general, any like inference you do or you sell as a service, you can prove that you're actually providing the committed uh, algorithm, which your user is uh, possibly paying for that. Uh, yeah, uh, any questions? Let's start by thanking the speaker. We have uh, several minutes for questions. I can go with one. Do you have an idea uh, in terms of efficiency, for example, how long would it take to do this for a SHA-256 circuit? So the point is that once you engage in like proof of function, the benchmarks are quite similar to what you have like in Planck for Marlin. There is not a uh, huge overhead in that. So you can like compare it to SHA-256 of like just non-functional proof. But uh, yeah, that, okay. that's pretty much it. Okay, I, I actually don't have an idea of how long.
how long it takes also in Planck? Would you would you know? Yeah, I have no idea. Also, like nobody uses <laughs> shaft. Any other question before lunch? What would proving that a function actually is a function look like? Uh -huh. So you have a lot of these polynomial identity checks, and that's why we built our framework. So you need to prove some discrete log inequalities and some well formations and uh, multi-equality sets. So it's quite technical. We can like go through it step by step, but there are like many sub protocols included. Going once, going twice. Let's thank the speaker again.